Chapter Three of Allan and the Holy Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Allan and the Holy Flower by H. Rider Haggard. Chapter Three. Sir Alexander and Stephen. It was just at this moment that I saw standing by me a fine-looking stout man with a square grey beard and a handsome but not very good-tempered face. He was looking about him as one does who finds himself in a place to which he is not accustomed. "'Perhaps you could tell me, sir,' he said to me, "'whether a gentleman called Mr. Summers is in this room. I am rather short-sighted, and there are a great many people.' "'Yes,' I answered. "'He has just bought the wonderful orchid called Dontoglossum Pavo. That is what they're all talking about.' "'Er, has he? Has he indeed? And pray, what did he pay for the article?' a huge sum i answered i thought it was two thousand three hundred shillings but it appears it was two thousand three hundred pounds the handsome elderly gentleman grew very red in the face so red that i thought he was going to have a fit for a few moments he breathed heavily a rival collector i thought to myself and went on with a story which it occurred to me might interest him you see, the young gentleman was called away to an interview with his father. I heard him instruct his gardener, a man called Wooden, to buy the plant at any price. At any price? Indeed. Very interesting. Continue, sir. Well, the gardener bought it, that's all, after tremendous competition. Look, there he is, packing it up. Whether his master meant him to go as far as he did, I rather doubt. But here he comes. If you know him... The youthful Mr. Summers, looking a little pale and distraught, strolled up apparently to speak to me. His hands were in his pockets, and an unlighted cigar was in his mouth. His eyes fell upon the elderly gentleman, a sight that caused him to shape his lips as though to whistle and drop the cigar. "'Hello, father,' he said in his pleasant voice. "'I got your message and have been looking for you, but never thought that I should find you here. Orchids aren't much in your line, are they?' didn't you indeed replied his parent in a choked voice no i haven't much use for this stinking rubbish and he waved his umbrella at the beautiful flowers but it seems that you have stephen this little gentleman here tells me that you've just bought a very fine specimen i must apologize i broke in addressing mr summers i had not the slightest idea that this big gentleman here the sun smiled faintly was your intimate relation oh pray don't mr quatermain why should you not speak of what will be in all the papers yes father i have bought a very fine specimen the finest known or at least wooden has on my behalf while i was hunting for you which comes to the same thing indeed stephen and what did you pay for this flower i have heard a figure but think that there must be some mistake i don't know what you heard father but it seems to have been knocked down to me at twenty three hundred pounds it's a lot more than i can find indeed and i was going to ask you to lend me the money for the sake of the family credit if not for my own but we can talk about that afterwards yes stephen we can talk of that afterwards in fact there is no time like the present we will talk of it now come to my office and sir this was addressed to me as you seem to know something of the circumstances i will ask you to come also and you too blockhead this was to wooden who just then approached with the plant now, of course, I might have refused an invitation conveyed in such a manner, but as a matter of fact, I didn't. I wanted to see the thing out, also to put in a word for young Summers if I got the chance. So we all departed from that room, followed by a titter of amusement from those of the company who had overheard the conversation. In the street stood a splendid carriage and pair. A powdered footman opened its door. With a ferocious bow, Sir Alexander motioned to me to enter, which I did, taking one of the back seats as it gave more room for my tin case. Then came Mr. Stephen, then Wooden, bundled in, holding the precious plant in front of him like a wand of office, and last of all Sir Alexander, having seen us safe, entered also. "'Where to, sir?' asked the footman. "'Office,' he snapped, and we started. Four disappointed relatives in a funeral coach could not have been more silent. Our feelings seemed to be too deep for words. Sir Alexander, however, did make one remark, and to me it was— if you will remove the corner of that infernal tin box of yours from my ribs, I shall be obliged to you, sir. Your pardon, I exclaimed, and in my efforts to be accommodating, dropped it on his toe. I will not repeat the remark he made, but I may explain that he was gouty. His son suddenly became afflicted with a sense of the absurdity of the situation. He kicked me on the shin, he even dared to wink, and then began to swell visibly with suppressed laughter. 
I was in agony, for if he had exploded I do not know what would have happened. Fortunately, at this moment the carriage stopped at the door of a fine office. Without waiting for the footman, Mr. Stephen bundled out and vanished into the building, I suppose to laugh in safety. Then I descended with the tin case, then by command followed Wooden with the flower, and lastly came Sir Alexander. "'Stop here!' he said to the coachman. "'I shan't be long. Be so good as to follow me, Mr. What's-your-name, and you too, Gardner.' We followed, and found ourselves in a big room luxuriously furnished in a heavy kind of way. Sir Alexander Summers, I should explain, was an enormously opulent bullion-broker, whatever a bullion-broker may be. In this room Mr. Stephen was already established. Indeed, he was seated on the window-sill, swinging his leg. "'Now we are alone and comfortable,' growled Sir Alexander with sarcastic ferocity. "'As the boa constrictor said to the rabbit in the cage,' I remarked. I did not mean to say it, but I had grown nervous, and the thought leapt from my lips in words. Again Mr. Stephen began to swell. He turned his face to the window as though to contemplate the wall beyond, but I could see his shoulders shaking. A dim light of intelligence shone in Wooden's pale eyes. About three minutes later the joke got home. He gurgled something about boa constrictors and rabbits, and gave a short, loud laugh. As for Sir Alexander, he merely said, "'I did not catch your remark, sir. Would you be so good as to repeat it?' As I appeared unwilling to accept the invitation, he went on, "'Perhaps, then, you would repeat what you told me in that sale-room.' "'Why should I?' I asked. "'I spoke quite clearly, and you seem to understand.' "'You are right,' replied Sir Alexander. "'To waste time is useless.' He wheeled round on Wooden, who was standing near the door, still holding the paper-wrapped plant in front of him. "'Now, blockhead!' he shouted. "'Tell me why you bought that thing!' Wooden made no answer, only rocked a little. Sir Alexander reiterated his command. This time Wooden set the plant upon a table and replied, "'If you are spiking to me, sir, that bain't my name, and what's more, if you calls me so again, I'll punch your head, whoever you may be.' And very deliberately he rolled up the sleeves on his brawny arms, a sight at which I too began to swell with inward merriment. "'Look here, father,' said Mr. Stephen, stepping forward. "'What's the use of all this? The thing's perfectly plain. I did tell Wooden to buy the plant at any price. What is more, I gave him a written authority which was passed up to the auctioneer. There's no getting out of it. It is true it never occurred to me that it would go for anything like twenty-three hundred pounds. The odd three hundred pounds was more my idea, but Wooden only obeyed his orders, and ought not to be abused for doing so.' "'That's what I call a master worth serving,' remarked Wooden. "'Very well, young man.' said sir alexander you have purchased this article would you be so good as to tell me how you propose it should be paid for i propose father that you should pay for it replied mr stephen sweetly two thousand three hundred pounds or ten times that amount would not make you appreciably poorer but if as is probable you take a different view then i propose to pay for it myself as you know a certain sum of money came to me under my mother's will in which you have only a life interest i shall raise the amount upon that security or otherwise if Sir Alexander had been angry before, now he became like a mad bull in a china shop. He pranced round the room. He used language that should not pass the lips of any respectable merchant of bullion. In short, he did everything that a person in his position ought not to do. When he was tired, he rushed to a desk, tore a cheque from a book, and filled it in for the sum of £2,300 to bearer, which cheque he blotted crumpled up and literally threw at the head of his son you worthless idle young scoundrel he bellowed i put you in this office here that you may learn respectable and orderly habits and in due course succeed to a very comfortable business what happens you don't take a ha'porth of interest in bullion broking a subject of which i believe you to remain profoundly ignorant you don't even spend your money, or rather my money, upon any gentleman-like vice, such as horse-racing or cards, or even, well, never mind. Now you take to flowers, miserable beastly flowers, things that a cow eats and clerks grow in back gardens. An ancient and Arcadian taste, Adam is supposed to have lived in a garden, I ventured to interpolate. Perhaps you would ask your friend with a stubbly hair to remain quiet, snorted Sir Alexander. I was about to add, 
although for the sake of my name i meet your debts that i have had enough of this kind of thing i disinherit you or will do if i live till four p m when the lawyer's office shuts for thank god there are no entailed estates and i dismiss you from the firm you can go and earn your living in any way you please by orchid hunting if you like he paused gasping for breath is that all father asked mr stephen producing a cigar from his pocket no it isn't you cold-blooded young beggar that house you occupy at twickenham is mine you will be good enough to clear out i wish to take possession i suppose father i am entitled to a week's notice like any other tenant said mr stephen lighting the cigar in fact he added if you answer no i think i shall ask you to apply for an ejection order you will understand that i have arrangements to make before making a fresh start in life oh curse your cheek you you cucumber raged the infuriated merchant prince then an inspiration came to him you think more of an ugly flower than of your father do you well at least i'll put an end to that and he made a dash at the plant on the table with the evident intention of destroying the same but the watching wooden saw with a kind of lurch he interposed his big frame between sir alexander and the object of his wrath touch o paving and i knocks you down he drawled out sir alexander looked at o paving he looked at wooden's leg of mutton fist and changed his mind curse o paving he said and every one who has to do with it and swung out of the room banging the door behind him well that's over said mr stephen gently as he fanned himself with a pocket handkerchief quite exciting while it lasted wasn't it mr quatermain but i have been there before so to speak and now what do you say to some luncheon pins is close by and they have very good oysters only i think we'll drive round by the bank and hand in this cheque when he's angry my parent is capable of anything he might even stop it wouldn't get off down to twickenham with opavo keep it warm for it feels rather like frost put it in the stove for to-night and give it a little just a little tepid water but be careful not to touch the flower take a four-wheeled cab it's slow but safe and mind you keep the windows up and don't smoke i shall be home for dinner wooden pulled his forelock seized the pot in his left hand and departed with his right fist raised i suppose in case sir alexander should be waiting for him round the corner then we departed also and after stopping for a minute at the bank to pay in the cheque which i noted notwithstanding its amount was accepted without comment ate oysters in a place too crowded to allow of conversation mr quatermain said my host it is obvious that we cannot talk here and much less look at that orchid of yours which i want to study at leisure now for a week or so at any rate i have a roof over my head and in short will you be my guest for a night or two i know nothing about you and of me you only know that i am the disinherited son of a father to whom i have failed to give satisfaction still it is possible that we might pass a few pleasant hours together talking of flowers and other things that is if you have no previous engagement i have none i answered i am only a stranger from south africa lodging at a hotel if you will give me time to call for my bag i will pass the night at your house with pleasure by the aid of mr summer's smart dog-cart which was waiting at a city mews we reached twickenham while there was still half an hour of daylight the house which was called verbena lodge was small a square red brick building of early georgian period but the gardens covered quite an acre of ground and were very beautiful or must have been so in summer into the greenhouse we did not enter because it was too late to see the flowers also just when we came to them wooden arrived in his four-wheeled cab and departed with his master to see the housing of opavo then came dinner a very pleasant meal my host had that day been turned out upon the world but he did not allow this circumstance to interfere with his spirits in the least also he was evidently determined to enjoy its good things while they lasted for his champagne and port were excellent you see mr quatermain he said it's just as well we had that row which has been boiling up for a long time my respected father has made so much money that he thinks i should go and do likewise now i don't see it i like flowers especially orchids and i hate bullion broking to me the only decent places in london are that sale-room where we met and the horticultural gardens yes i answered rather doubtfully but the matter seems a little serious your parent was very emphatic as to his intentions and after this kind of thing and i pointed to the beautiful silver and the port how will you like roughing it in a hard world don't think i shall mind a bit it would be rather a pleasant change 
also even if my father doesn't alter his mind as he may for he likes me at bottom because i resemble my dear mother things ain't so very bad i have got some money that she left me six thousand or seven thousand pounds and i'll sell that odontoglossum parva for what it will fetch to sir joshua treadgold he was the man with a long beard who you tell me ran up wooden to over two thousand pounds or failing him to someone else i'll write about it to-night i don't think i have any debts to speak of for the governor has been allowing me three thousand pounds a year at least that is my share of the profits paid to me in return for my bullion broking labours and except flowers i have no expensive tastes so the devil take the past here's to the future whatever it may bring and he polished off the glass of port he held and laughed in his jolly fashion really he was a most attractive young man a little reckless it is true but then recklessness and youth mix well like brandy and soda i echoed the toast and drank off my port for i like a good glass of wine when i can get it as would any one who has had to live for months on rotten water although i admit that agrees with me better than the port now mr quatermain he went on if you have done light your pipe and let us go into the other room and study that cypripedium of yours i shan't sleep to-night unless i see it again first stop a bit though we'll get hold of that old ass wooden before he turns in wooden said his master when the gardener had arrived this gentleman mr quatermain is going to show you an orchid that is ten times finer than opavo beg pardon sir answered wooden but if mr quatermain says that he lies it ain't in nature it don't bloom nowhere i opened the case and revealed the golden cypripedium wooden stared at it and rocked then he stared again and felt his head as though to make sure it was on his shoulders then he gasped well if that there flower bait made up it's a master one if i could see that there flower a-blowin on the plant i'd die happy wouldn't stop talking and sit down exclaimed his master yes there where you can look at the flower now mr quatermain will you tell us the story of that orchid from beginning to end of course omitting its habitat if you like for it isn't fair to ask that secret wooden can be trusted to hold his tongue and so can i i remarked that i was sure they could and for the next half hour talked almost without interruption keeping nothing back and explaining that i was anxious to find someone who would finance an expedition to search for this particular plant as i believed the only one of its sort that existed in the world how much will it cost asked mr somers i lay it at two thousand pounds i answered you see we must have plenty of men and guns and stores also trade goods and presents i call that cheap but supposing mr quatermain that the expedition proves successful and the plant is secured what then then i propose that brother john who found it and of whom i have told you should take one-third of whatever it might sell for that i as captain of the expedition should take one-third and that whoever finds the necessary money should take the remaining third good that's settled what's settled i asked why that we should divide in the proportions you named only i bargain to be allowed to take my whack in kind i mean in plant and to have the first option of purchasing the rest of the plant at whatever value may be agreed upon but mr somers do you mean that you wish to find two thousand pounds and make this expedition in person of course i do i thought you understood that that is if you will have me your old friend the lunatic you and i will together seek for and find this golden flower i say that's settled on the morrow accordingly it was settled with the help of a document signed in duplicate by both of us before these arrangements were finally concluded however i insisted that mr somers should meet my late companion charlie scroop when i was not present in order that the latter might give him a full and particular report concerning myself apparently the interview was satisfactory at least so i judged from the very cordial and even respectful manner in which young somers met me after it was over also i thought it my duty to explain to him with much clearness in the presence of scroop as a witness the great dangers of such an enterprise as that on which he proposed to embark i told him straight out that he must be prepared to find his death in it from starvation fever wild beasts or at the hands of savages while success was quite problematical and very likely would not be attained you are taking these risks he said yes i answered but they are incident to the rough trade i follow which is that of a hunter and explorer moreover my youth is past i have gone through experiences and bereavements of which you know nothing that cause me to set a very slight value on life i care little whether i die or continue in the world for some few added years lastly the excitement of adventure has become a kind of necessity for me 
i do not think that i could live in england for very long also i am a fatalist i believe that when my time comes i must go that this hour is foreordained and that nothing i can do will either hasten or postpone it by one moment your circumstances are different you are quite young if you stay here and approach your father in a proper spirit i have no doubt that he will forgive all the rough words he said to you the other day for which indeed you know you gave him some provocation is it worth while throwing up such prospects and undertaking such dangers for the chance of finding a rare flower i say this to my own disadvantage since i might find it hard to discover any one else who would risk two thousand pounds on such a venture but i do urge you to weigh my words young summers looked at me for a little while then he broke into one of his hearty laughs and exclaimed whatever else you may be mr allan quatermain you are a gentleman no bullion broker in the city could have put the matter more fairly in the teeth of his own interests thank you i said for the rest he went on i am too tired of england and want to see the world it isn't the golden cypripedium that i seek although i should like to win it well enough that's only a symbol what i seek are adventure and romance also like you i am a fatalist god chose his own time to send us here and i presume that he will choose his own time to take us away again so i leave the matter of risks to him yes mr summers i replied rather solemnly you may find adventure and romance there are plenty both in africa or you may find a nameless grave in some fever-haunted swamp well you have chosen and i like your spirit still i was so little satisfied about this business that a week or so before we sailed after much consideration i took it upon myself to write a letter to sir alexander summers in which i set forth the whole matter as clearly as i could not blinking the dangerous nature of our undertaking in conclusion i asked him whether he thought it wise to allow his only son to accompany such an expedition mainly because of a not very serious quarrel with himself as no answer came to this letter i went on with our preparations there was money in plenty since the resale of opavo to sir joshua treadgold at some loss had been satisfactorily carried out which enabled me to invest in all things needful with a cheerful heart never before had i been provided with such an outfit as that which preceded us to the ship at length the day of departure came we stood on the platform at paddington waiting for the dartmouth train to start for in those days the african mail sailed from that port a minute or two before the train left as we were preparing to enter our carriage i caught sight of a face that i seemed to recognize the owner of which was evidently searching for someone in the crowd it was that of briggs sir alexander's clerk whom i had met in the sale-room mr briggs i said as he passed me are you looking for mr summers if so he is in here the clerk jumped into the compartment and handed a letter to mr summers then he emerged again and waited summers read the letter and tore off a blank sheet from the end of it on which he hastily wrote some words he passed it to me to give to briggs and i could not help seeing what was written it was too late now god bless you my dear father i hope we may meet again if not try to think kindly of your troublesome and foolish son stephen in another minute the train had started by the way he said as we steamed out of the station i have heard from my father who enclosed this for you I opened the envelope, which was addressed in a bold round hand that seemed to me typical of the writer. It read as follows. My dear sir, I appreciate the motives which caused you to write to me, and I thank you very heartily for your letter, which shows me that you are a man of discretion and strict honour. As you surmise, the expedition on which my son has entered is not one that commands itself to me as prudent. Of the differences between him and myself you are aware, for they came to a climax in your presence indeed i feel that i owe you an apology for having dragged you into an unpleasant family quarrel your letter only reached me to-day having been forwarded to my place in the country from my office i should have at once come to town but unfortunately i am laid up with an attack of gout which makes it impossible for me to stir therefore the only thing i can do is to write to my son hoping that the letter which i send by a special messenger will reach him in time and avail to alter his determination to undertake his journey here i may add that although i have differed and do differ from him on various points i still have a deep affection for my son and earnestly desire his welfare the prospect of any harm coming to him is one upon which i cannot bear to dwell 
now i am aware that any change of his plans at this eleventh hour would involve you in serious loss and inconvenience i beg to inform you formally therefore that in this event i will make good everything and will in addition write off the two thousand pounds which i understand he has invested in your joint venture it may be however that my son who has in him a vein of my own obstinacy will refuse to change his mind in that event under a higher power i can only commend him to your care and beg that you will look after him as though he were your own child i can ask and you can do no more tell him to write to me as opportunity offers as perhaps you will too also that although i hate the sight of them i will look after the flowers which he has left at the house at twickenham your obliged servant alexander summers this letter touched me and indeed made me feel very uncomfortable without a word i handed it to my companion who read it through carefully nice of him about the orchids he said my dad has a good heart although he lets his temper get the better of him having had his own way all his life well what will you do i asked go on of course i've put my hand to the plough and i'm not going to turn back i should be a cur if i did and what's more whatever he might say he'd think none the better of me so please don't try to persuade me it would be no good for quite a while afterwards young summers seemed to be comparatively depressed a state of mind that in his case was rare indeed at last he studied the wintry landscape through the carriage window and said nothing by degrees however he recovered and when we reached dartmouth was as cheerful as ever a mood that i could not altogether share before we sailed i wrote to sir alexander telling him exactly how things stood and so i think did his son though he never showed me the letter at durban just as we were about to start up country i received an answer from him sent by some boat that followed us very closely in it he said that he quite understood the position and whatever happened would attribute no blame to me whom he should always regard with friendly feelings he told me that in the event of any difficulty or want of money i was to draw on him for whatever might be required and that he had advised the african bank to that effect further he added that at least his son had shown grit in this matter for which he respected him and now for a long while i must bid good-bye to sir alexander summers and all that has to do with england End of chapter three